as we turn back the pages of time, landing in the tranquil hamlet of Polstead, Suffolk. In the 1800s, a bone-chilling saga begins to unravel, ensnaring the sentiments and igniting dread within generations yet unborn. The tale takes root in the unnerving premonitions of Anne Martin, a woman bound by matrimony to Maria Martin's father, a young damsel who found herself entrapped in a labyrinth of passion, cunning, and tragic demise. Anne Martin's vivid and prophetic dreams seemed to foretell a grim fate, raising suspicions and setting in motion a series of events that would lead to the discovery of a heinous crime. As whispers spread throughout the community, doubts were cast upon the dreams themselves, hinting at ulterior motives and hidden truths. Welcome to the Detective Verse, where we travel into the universe of solved and unsolved crimes and mysteries from all corners of the galaxy. In today's video, we will cover the story of the Red Barn Murder, a chilling story that unfolded in the early 19th century, driven by the unsettling dreams of a grandmother whose prophetic visions warned of a sinister fate lurking within the infamous Red Barn where love, betrayal, and treachery entwined to reveal a shocking truth that would forever stain the pages of history. Maria Martin, a young and alluring woman hailing from the humble village of Polstead, Suffolk, entered the pages of history with a tale of love and tragedy. In the spring of 1826, at the age of 24, Maria's path intertwined with that of the dashing 22-year-old William Corder. Prior to this fateful encounter, Maria's life had already seen its share of heartaches and joys. Two children, products of her previous relationships with local men, had blessed her existence. Sadly, one child belonging to Corder's elder brother Thomas had met an untimely demise as an infant. Yet her bond with Thomas Henry, her surviving child from her liaison with Peter Matthews, remained intact, as he provided for them despite never marrying Maria. William Corder, a charismatic scoundrel born in 1803, was the son of a respected farmer, yet his reputation painted a different picture altogether. With his cunning ways and a knack for charming the ladies, he earned the nickname Foxy during his school days. Early signs of deceit were evident when Corder shamelessly swindled unsuspecting buyers by selling his father's pigs under false pretenses. Although his father resolved the matter privately, it failed to deter Corder from his dubious path. In time, he ventured down the dark alley of deceit, orchestrating a scheme involving a counterfeit check amounting to a staggering 93 pounds. As if that weren't enough, Corder's mischievous collaborations with the local thief, Samuel Beauty Smith, even included pilfering a pig from a neighboring village. The stage was set for a chilling turn of events when Smith decided to confront Corder regarding the stolen pig. In a moment that would later echo hauntingly, Smith uttered a foreboding statement that seemed to foreshadow Corder's fate. I'll be damned if he will not be hung one of these days. Corder's actions had already earned him a one-way ticket to London, where he was sent in disgrace after his deceitful pig sale came to light. However, a tragic twist of fate called him back to Polstead as news of his elder brother Thomas's untimely death. He had drowned in an ill-fated attempt to cross a frozen pond. The Grim Reaper seemed to hover over the Quarter family, as within a span of just 18 months, Quarter's father and three brothers also succumbed to death, leaving him as the sole remaining caretaker of the family farm alongside his mother. Amidst this turbulent backdrop, Quarter and Maria Martin desperately clung to the secrecy of their relationship. However, the ties that bound them grew stronger when Maria, at the age of 25, gave birth to their child in 1827. Maria, seemingly eager for their union, yearned for marriage with Corder. Tragically, their child would not survive, with subsequent reports hinting at the possibility of a sinister end. Yet, Corder's intention appeared resolute, as he still harbored plans to wed Maria even in the face of mounting darkness. As the summer days stretched on, a focal moment arose when Corder, in the presence of Maria's stepmother, Anne Martin, proposed a daring plan. He suggested that Maria meet him at the infamous Red Barn, where he unveiled his scheme for them to elope to Ipswich. Fueling his proposal were rumors swirling about the impending prosecution of Maria Martin by the parish officers for her status as a mother of illegitimate children. Initially, Corder set Wednesday evening as their escape date, 
but he later decided to postpone it to Thursday evening. However, another setback intervened, with some sources citing his brother's sudden illness, despite claims that all his brothers had already passed away. Finally, on that fateful Friday, on May 18, 1827, Corder made an appearance at the Martins' cottage during the daylight hours. Anne recalled that he urgently informed Maria that they had to depart immediately, for he had supposedly learned that the local constable had obtained a warrant for her arrest, though no such warrant existed, leaving uncertainty as to whether Corder was lying or simply misinformed. Maria, feeling uneasy about leaving in broad daylight, expressed her concerns. Yet, Corder proposed a solution to avoid suspicion. He suggested that she wear men's clothing while he would carry her belongings to the Red Barn, where they could change before continuing their journey to Ipswich. The stage was set for a secret escape. After Corder departed from the Martins' residence, Maria Martin embarked on her journey to meet him at the notorious Red Barn, perched upon Barnfield Hill, a mere half mile from her cottage. Little did anyone know that it would be the last time she would be seen alive. Corder vanished into the shadows as well, but he eventually resurfaced, spinning a tale that Maria Martin had made her way to Ipswich or some nearby location. He claimed he couldn't bring her back as his lawful wife just yet, fearing the wrath of his friends and kin. The mounting pressure on Corder to present his wife to the world eventually became unbearable, forcing him to flee the vicinity. In his attempts to pacify Martin's family, he penned letters asserting that they were wedded and dwelled on the Isle of Wight. He made up various excuses to account for her lack of communication, ailing health, an injured hand, or the possibility of misplaced correspondence. As suspicion reached its peak, Maria Martin's stepmother, haunted by unsettling dreams, could no longer contain her fears. She voiced her concerns that Maria had met a tragic fate, envisioning her lifeless body buried within the confines of the Red Burn. Persuading her husband, they mustered the courage to confront the eerie suspicion. On that fateful day of April 19, 1828, they embarked on a journey to the Red Burn where they began to dig into one of the grain storage bins. In a chilling discovery, the remains of their beloved daughter were unearthed, hidden within a sack. Despite the advanced state of composition, Maria's identity remained discernible. An inquest ensued at the Cock Inn in Polstead, an establishment that still stands today where Maria Martin was officially recognized by her sister Anne through distinct physical attributes. Her hair and fragments of clothing served as familiar markers, and the absence of a tooth in the recovered jawbone matched the tooth that Maria was known to be missing. As the investigation unfolded, damning evidence emerged, firmly implicating Corder in the heinous crime. His green handkerchief was found tightly wound around the neck of the lifeless body, leaving little room for doubt. The Red Barn, once a place of clandestine meetings and forbidden secrets, now held the chilling truth that would forever stain the memory of William Corder and Maria Martin. Corder's attempts to hide were short-lived, as the resourceful Constable heirs, aided by James Lee of London, swiftly traced him. Through a friend, heirs obtained Corder's previous address, leading them to Everly Grove House, a boarding house in Brentford. Corder now ran the establishment with his new wife, Mary Moore whom he had encountered through a Lonely Hearts advertisement he had placed in the Times. His advertisement had garnered over 100 responses, revealing the depths of his deceitful charm. Seizing an opportune moment, James Lee assumed the guise of a concerned father seeking boarding for his daughter and gained entry into Everly Grove House. With the element of surprise on his side, James Lee confronted Corder in the parlor, where he sat amidst four ladies, casually attired in a dressing gown and observing the boiling of eggs with a watch before him, meticulously noting the passing seconds. The net had closed in on the Red Barn murderer, and justice was poised to take its course. Upon James Lee's intervention, he discreetly pulled Corder aside and delivered the grave charges against him. However, Corder adamantly denied any knowledge of Maria Martin or the heinous crime. A thorough search of the premises ensued, unearthing a pair of pistols allegedly purchased on the day of the murder, a collection of letters from a certain Mr. Gardner that potentially contained warnings about the discovery of the crime, and a passport issued by the French ambassador, suggesting Corder's possible intentions to flee. With mounting evidence against him, Corder was escorted back to Suffolk, 
where he faced trial at Shire Hall in Barrie, St. Edmunds. The trial, scheduled to commence on 7th August 1828, was pushed back several days due to the immense public interest it had garnered. Hotels in Barrie, St. Edmunds quickly filled up, and entry to the court was restricted to ticket holders only, owing to the overwhelming number of spectators eager to witness the proceedings. Nonetheless, the judge and court officials had to physically navigate their way through the teeming crowds that had gathered around the entrance. Presiding over the trial was Chief Baron of the Exchequer, William Alexander, who expressed his displeasure with the media's coverage of the case, believing it to be detrimental to the accused. However, despite the buzz surrounding the trial, Corder, defiantly pleading not guilty, received little sympathy from the public. The exact cause of Maria Martin's death remained elusive. One theory suggested that a sharp object, possibly Corder's short sword, had been thrust into her eye socket, though it was also plausible that her father's spade had inadvertently caused this wound during the exhumation process. Strangulation was another possibility as Corder's handkerchief had been discovered tightly wrapped around her neck. The presence of wounds on her body also indicated the potential use of firearms. The complexity of the case prompted the indictment to charge Corder with multiple offenses. The indictment accused him of murdering Maria Martin by feloniously and willfully shooting her with a pistol through the body and likewise stabbing her with a dagger. To eliminate any risk of a mistrial, Corder faced a total of nine charges, including one related to forgery. During the trial, crucial testimony shed light on the events surrounding Maria Martin's disappearance and the subsequent investigation. Anne Martin, Maria's mother, took the stand, providing her account of the events that unfolded on the day Maria vanished, as well as her own unsettling dreams. Thomas Martin, Maria's father, testified about the harrowing discovery of his daughter's remains. Additionally, Maria's younger brother George, a mere 10 years old, bravely recounted seeing Corder in possession of a loaded pistol before the alleged murder. George further testified that he had witnessed Corder emerging from the barn with a pickaxe. James Lee, instrumental in Corder's apprehension, shared his evidence regarding the arrest and the incriminating objects uncovered during the search of Corder's residence. The prosecution built their case, suggesting that Corder never truly intended to marry Maria Martin. Instead, they posited that Maria's knowledge of some of Corder's criminal activities had given her leverage over him. Tensions further arose between them due to Corder's theft of the funds sent by the father of Maria's child. The prosecution sought to paint a picture of a turbulent relationship, fueled by secrets, manipulation, and the underlying weight of Corder's unlawful deeds. When given the opportunity to present his side of the story, Corder offered his own version of events. He admitted to being present in the barn with Maria, but claimed that he had left her after a heated argument. According to Corder, while he was walking away, he heard the sound of a gunshot. Filled with dread, he hurried back to the barn only to discover Maria lifeless with one of his own pistols beside her. Corder pleaded with the jury to give him the benefit of the doubt, hoping they would see the situation from his perspective. However, after deliberation, the jury quickly reached their verdict. Guilty. In a mere 35 minutes, their decision was delivered. Baron Alexander, presiding over the trial, passed the sentence upon Corder to be hanged until dead, followed by the dissection and anatomization of his body. With a somber tone, the judge concluded, May the Lord God Almighty, of his infinite goodness, have mercy on your soul. The die had been cast, sealing Corder's fate and bringing the trial to its solemn conclusion. In the agonizing days leading up to his execution, William Corder grappled with his conscience, torn between confessing to the crime and seeking redemption before his impending fate. Encouraged by his wife, numerous interactions with the prison chaplain, and appeals from his warder and the prison governor, John Orridge, Corder ultimately made the decision to admit his guilt. However, he vehemently denied the act of stabbing Martin, instead claiming that her tragic death resulted from an accidental gunshot during a heated argument while she was in the process of removing her disguise. On August 11, 1828, Corder was escorted to the gallows in Barry St. Edmunds, reportedly too weak to stand unaided. Shortly before noon, in the presence of a sizable crowd, with estimates ranging from 7,000 to as many as 20,000 spectators, Corder was hanged. As the hood was drawn over his head, at the urging of the prison governor, he spoke his last words. I am guilty. 
My sentence is just, I deserve my fate. And may God have mercy on my soul. After an hour, the hangman, John Foxton, took down Quarter's lifeless body, exercising his rights to claim the trousers and stockings. The body was then transported back to the courtroom at Shire Hall, where it was subjected to a grim spectacle. The abdomen was slit open, exposing the muscles, and the doors were opened to allow the curious crowds to file past. According to the Norwich and Berry Post, over 5,000 people patiently queued for the macabre opportunity to view the lifeless remains of William Quarter. The curtain finally closed on this harrowing chapter, leaving a lasting impression on the collective memory of the Red Barn murder. The day following Quarter's execution, a dissection and post-mortem examination took place in the presence of an audience consisting of students from Cambridge University and physicians. Rumors circulated throughout Barry St. Edmunds that a galvanic battery had been brought from Cambridge, which suggested the possibility that the group engaged in galvanism experiments on the body. It is believed that a battery was attached to Quarter's limbs, causing the muscles to contract and showcasing the phenomenon to the onlookers. The sternum was opened, granting access to the internal organs, and discussions ensued regarding the cause of death. Some speculated suffocation, as witnesses claimed to have seen Quarter's chest rise and fall for several minutes after he was hanged, which led to the belief that pressure on the spinal cord might have been the fatal blow. Due to the planned reassembly of the skeleton following the dissection, further examination of the brain was not possible. Consequently, the surgeons turned their attention to a phrenological examination of Quarter's skull. They noted that the skull exhibited a profound development in areas such as secretiveness, acquisitiveness, destructiveness, philoprogenitiveness, and imitativeness, while showing limited evidence of benevolence or veneration. This examination aimed to understand the underlying characteristics and mental tendencies associated with the bumps and indentations on the skull's surface. Moises Hall Museum in Barry St. Edmunds houses an original bust of Quarter, created by Child of Bungay, which serves as a tool for the study of his phrenology. Following William Quarter's demise, several copies of his death mask were created, with a replica still held at Moises Hall Museum. His widow even advertised for the sale of his purported trial glasses and a snuff box featuring a likeness of Maria Martin. The museum also houses artifacts from the trial, including items that were once in Quarter's possession. Another replica death mask can be found in the dungeons of Norwich Castle. Quarter's skin was tanned by Surgeon George Creed and utilized to bind an account of the murder. This unique artifact is on display at Moises Hall Museum, offering a haunting reminder of the grim tale. Additionally, Quarter's reassembled skeleton was exhibited and utilized as a teaching aid in the West Suffolk Hospital. For a time, the skeleton hung in the Hunterian Museum at the Royal College of Surgeons of England sharing space with the remains of the infamous Jonathan Wild. In 2004, Quarter's bones were respectfully removed from display and cremated, bringing an end to their public exhibition. The case of the Red Barn murder, with its eerie relics and grim remnants, continues to captivate and intrigue visitors to these museums, preserving the dark legacy of William Quarter's heinous act for future generations. After the trial concluded, Doubts and speculation arose regarding the credibility of Anne Martin's dreams and the fate of Quarter and Maria Martin's child. Both Quarter and Martin claimed to have taken the deceased child to be buried in Sudbury, but no records of such a burial could be found, and the actual burial site remained elusive. In Quarter's written confession, he admitted that he and Martin had argued on the day of the murder concerning the possibility of the burial site being discovered which added further mystery to the fate of the child. In 1967, Donald McCormick's book, The Red Burn Mystery, brought forth a connection between Quarter and the forger and serial killer Thomas Griffiths Wainwright during their time in London. McCormick cited actress Caroline Palmer, who extensively researched the murder while performing in a melodrama based on the Red Burn case. Palmer concluded that Quarter may not have been the killer, proposing that a local gypsy woman could have been responsible. However, it's worth noting that McCormick's research has been questioned in relation to other police and crime stories, and his conclusions have not gained widespread acceptance. The Red Barn murder continues to be shrouded in mystery and controversy, with various theories and speculations persisting over the years. Ultimately, the exact truth behind the events may never be definitively uncovered.
As the echoes of the Red Burn murder fade into the annals of time, questions linger, enticing us to delve deeper into the enigma that surrounds this haunting tale. What were the true motivations that drove William Corder and those entangled in this web of deceit? Could there be hidden secrets yet to be unearthed, waiting to shed new light on the tragic events that unfolded? Let us know your thoughts down below.